Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and greetings to everyone connected for this annual BRICS Financial Forum being hosted by the Export Import Bank of India. On behalf of India Exim Bank, I extend a very warm welcome to all our esteemed guests from the member development banks of the BRICS Interbank Cooperation Mechanism, namely the Brazilian Development Bank, Russia State Development Corporation, VBRF, the China Development Bank, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, along with my colleagues from India Exim Bank. A warm welcome to the President and delegates from the New Development Bank. A very special and warm welcome to the Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India, Dr. Bhagwat Kishan Rao Karad, who would be gracing this occasion with his very esteemed presence in a few minutes from now. We are honored to have all of you with us today for this virtual meeting. Thank you very much for joining us. To start this important forum, I would like to invite my managing director, Madam Harsha Bangari, to kindly give her welcome address, please. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bhagwat Kishan Rao Karad, uh, Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India. Mr. Gustavo Montezano, President, Brazilian Development Bank. Ms. Natalia Timakova, Deputy Chairperson and Member of Board, VEBRF. Ms. Gaule, Vice President, China Development Bank. Professor Mark Swilling, Deputy Chairman, Development Bank of Southern Africa. Mr. Marcos Prado Troyo, President, New Development Bank. Delegates from the BRICS Member Development Banks, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of us. On behalf of India Exim Bank, I extend a warm welcome to all of you for the BRICS Annual Financial Forum 2021. We are indeed honored to have in our midst the Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India. Sir, a special and warm welcome to you to this financial forum being hosted by India Exim Bank. Your presence reflects the importance that the Government of India accords to this financial forum and the engagement amongst the BRICS countries. The last one and a half years has been quite unusual for all of us and the fact that we are meeting virtually today, even as we approach the end of 2021 in a few months, is a testimony of the seriousness and gravity of the disruptions that almost all economies have witnessed and are still witnessing. This was something that none of us would have anticipated at the outbreak of the pandemic. An important pillar of intra-BRICS cooperation in 2021 includes promoting economic growth and development for mutual prosperity. This is envisaged through expansion of cooperation in sectors such as trade, agriculture, infrastructure, small and medium enterprises, energy, and finance and banking. The theme of this year's BRICS Financial Forum is promoting economic growth and prosperity through BRICS financial cooperation. India Exim Bank would continue to support and contribute towards strengthening of the BRICS cooperation in line with the thrust and focus of the Government of India. Financing for developmental activities has been a challenge, especially for the developing world. BRICS nations have been playing an important role in alleviating infrastructure bottlenecks in many developing countries. We as BRICS development banks have also been individually contributing to the growth of other developing economies, not only within our region, but also across continents. Some of the infrastructure projects supported by BRICS nations are multinational and regional projects, which help improve not only cross-border infrastructure, but also help expand the regional trade. With the vast experience we have gained as development banks of BRICS nations in financing large-scale infrastructure projects and mobilizing resources domestically and internationally from public and private sources, it is important that we come together to collaborate and devise innovative collaborative mechanisms to further develop infrastructure within BRICS. We need to extend technical assistance by sharing our expertise amongst our own economies and more importantly with other developing countries. As developing countries, it is important for all of us to stimulate strong, balanced, sustainable and inclusive growth at the national and global level and to actively cooperate and partner with each other in e narrowing existing development gaps and addressing common economic and social challenges. It is imperative to build mutually beneficial partnerships based on the principles of South-South cooperation, extended not only to trade and investment, but also for technology transfer, knowledge sharing and skill building. 
the current global environment definitely calls for greater and stronger cooperation among the developing economies of BRICS, which are often considered as global growth engines. In the wake of current scenario of the global pandemic and the crisis the world is witnessing today, it becomes essential for us to share and learn from our best practices and measures that our respective national governments and member institutions of the ICM are taking to reboost and re-energize economies out of this crisis. As member development banks of the BRICS nations, we must continue to collaborate through emphasis on innovation and sharing of our expertise. While ideas are the first step towards transformation, collaboration amongst parties is imperative for effective action to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your welcome address and for initiating the deliberations of this evening's meeting. May I now invite Mr. Gustavo Montezano, President, Brazilian Development Bank, to address the participants, please. First of, first, I would like to thank the Indian Exim Bank for hosting this relevant annual meeting that you are here hosting virtually among our uh, uh, collaborators and peers in the BRICS country. We're living this pandemic with uh, a scenario where poor families, they are even more poor. The same applies for countries. Emerging market countries will have a big, big challenge ahead. Both a social, a, a social challenge and also all the green transition and the green just transition that we're handling across different countries. That's why more than ever, we should be working together and collaborating among emerging market banks and DFIs. The role of DFIs has been materially increasing over the last two years. We all had critical uh, actions during the crisis, and now we need to rebuild our countries in a new, different way. Speaking about BNDS strategy, we like to share four main pillars we've been working on. First one is infrastructure. Second one, sustainability. The third one, SMEs, and the fourth one, export import. On infrastructure, uh, we would like to crowd in additional lenders to Brazil, co-financing, syndicating deals alongside with BNDES. We are looking not only for capital, but for knowledge, for standards, for collaboration. Increasing the quantity of infrastructure lenders in Brazil will materially uh, benefit the quality of our projects. For the last two years, we'll be investing a lot of in technical assistance, both for federal government and for regional governments in Brazil. It has been an extremely well succeeded strategy. As of today, we are handling 120 projects across different sectors, and they have embedded capex of more than $40 billion without counting on goodwills or equity premiums that may be got on the auction. All those projects, they are available for consultation in our digital hub. I invite all the members here and the colleagues to visit our digital website with all the projects. And the more you have additional members participating and uh, sharing through digital contact their infrastructure pipelines, more benefit will be shared among emerging market peers. The second pillar, is sustainability. We do think that uh, if we make a green, transi a green transition, but in, in, the, in a manner, in a way that is applied in, with policies and procedures adequate for emerging market, um, emerging market countries, that can be a benefit for emerging market countries. Not necessarily, not necessarily policies and procedures that applies in developing world may be applying in our environment. Overall, emerging market countries, we are much, much, much less users or emissions of, of carbon credit and you handle much more biodiversity. If you do the green finance, the green transition, not just in proper way and adaptable for our, our reality, it may be a good opportunity for emerging market countries to collaborate and to benefit from this green transition. Speaking about our fourth third pillar, which the SMEs. We have a very good experience during the crisis 
of uh, 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 developing Brazil or capitalizing Brazil credit insurance. We do think that uh, it, it, it brought Brazil to a new level in credit insurance market, which is usual in many different market accounts across the world, but in Brazil was not the case. And we do want to increase uh, bank competition. We do work as a second uh, wholesale bank. So our mission here is to increase competition on the retail for the Brazilian entrepreneurs. Alongside with credit access is innovation. So co-investing with uh, private, private players and uh, uh, additional uh, government body entities will be financing and support innovation as a critical asset. Recognize, recognizing the value and the potential of un intangible assets within innovation for SMEs across Brazil. The last and fourth pillar of our strategy is export import activities. We do need to improve a lot as a country in Brazil in the tools, speed, and flexibility of our export and import financing uh, tools. That's why BNDS is fully positioned and committed to play a critical role on the export and import trades uh, within and from Brazil. So thank you very much, the Indian colleagues for hosting such re relevant events and do reinforce the importance of collaboration across emerging market countries in this new world, where we have a social, uh, a big social challenge ahead and a big green opportunity for emerging market accounts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your address and for highlighting some of the areas of our cooperation that the members of the Interbank Cooperation Mechanism could look forward to. I now invite Ms. Natalia Timakova, Deputy Chairperson and Member of the Board, VEDRF, to kindly address us, please. Уважаемые коллеги, очень рада приветствовать вас из столицы России, города Москва. Очень приятно было с коллегами обсудить роль банков в развитии БРИКС в перезапуске инвестиционного цикла и восстановлении экономической активности в постпандемийный период. Наши организации активно задействованы в реализации правительственных программ по таким направлениям, как поддержка среднего и малого предпринимательства, развитие системы образования и здравоохранения, финансирование проектов в сфере промышленности, инфраструктуры, цифрового развития. Хотела бы особо отметить роль нового банка развития, который в пандемию оперативно разработал и реализовал программу экстренной помощи странам-акционерам, оказав поддержку их государственным бюджетам в том числе и Российской Федерации. Буквально на днях НБР сообщил о запуске процесса присоединения новых членов – Объединенных Арабских Эмиратов, Уругвая и Бангладеш. Уверены, что такое расширение географии его участников будет способствовать превращению НБР в ключевой многосторонний банк развития для формирующегося рынка. Чтобы восстановление после пандемии носило долгосрочный устойчивый характер, мы предлагаем ориентироваться на повестку ESG-трансформации и учитывать запрос на изменение качества жизни обычной городской семьи. Уверены, что ММС БРИКС может стать мастерской для сборки новых финансовых идей, моделей и проектов по тем направлениям, которые не только стимулируют экономический рост, но и дают комплексные социальные, экологические, управленческие эффекты. Приведу три примера из нашего портфеля – портфеля корпорации ВПРФ. Первый проект – школы. По поручению президента в России реализуется программа строительства новых школ. Речь идет не просто о создании новых мест, но и о качественном изменении всей системы школьного образования. Программа рассчитана на пять лет, и в ходе нее должны качественно измениться не только сами школы как архитектурное строение, но и школы как принцип образования. К финансированию таких проектов будут привлечены частные инвесторы. Впервые школы будут строиться на принципах концессии. Наша корпорация будет принимать в этом активное участие. Второй пример – это университетские кампусы. Мы создаем в стране целую сеть современных университетских городков, включающих коворкинги, учебные аудитории, технопарки, библиотеки, возможности для спорта, современное жилье для студентов и преподавателей. Рассчитываем, что кампусы станут точкой притяжения для городов. Эта программа уже вызвала большой интерес, и большое количество российских городов хотят принять в ней участие, так как понимают, что это не только новые здания, но и новые энергии, новые смыслы, новая качественная жизнь. Третий пример – модернизация систем общественного транспорта. 
При участии в ЭП сейчас готовится порядка 12 проектов, которые должны полностью изменить систему общественного транспорта в разных городах. Среди основных эффектов от его реализации – снижение аварийности на дорогах, уменьшение вредных выбросов в атмосферу, оптимизация маршрутной сети. И главное – больше комфорт передвижения и новое восприятие горожанами своего города. Все эти проекты еще совсем недавно были нетипичны для нашей корпорации, но пандемия и новое время, новые вызовы заставляют нас все больше поворачиваться к социальным проектам для того, чтобы быть партнерами не только государства, но и жителей нашей страны. Направление, связанное с комплексом развития городской экономики, один из приоритетов нашей новой стратегии группы ВЭП. Отметим, что это корреспондируется и с подходами нового банка развития. НБР финансирует такие проекты, как реконструкция малых исторических городов России, модернизация маршрутной сети бразильской Куритибы, развитие высокоскоростных транспортных сетей в Индии. Предлагаем здесь активнее обмениваться опытом и лучшими практиками финансирования проектов, совместно работать над их масштабированием и возможной реализацией на территории сразу нескольких государств форума. Рассчитываем также на продолжение совместной работы по тем инициативам, которые выдвинули в прошлом году в ходе российского председательства в ММС БРИКС. Речь идет о выработке рекомендаций по имплементации принципов ответственного финансирования с учетом опыта и лучших практики ОС и разработки инфраструктурной цифровой платформы БРИКС. Перспективным представляется и расширение практики использования национальных валют, прежде всего при кредитовании совместных проектов. Достаточно количество проектов, которые могли бы объединить наши усилия по созданию более лучшей, более справедливой жизни в наших странах. Я хотел бы поблагодарить организаторов этой конференции за возможность обсудить, обменяться мнениями, услышать, что вы делаете в своих странах и для того, чтобы объединить наши усилия. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, Madam, for sharing your perspectives on the subject and for highlighting areas of cooperation among the BRICS, and also for sharing expertise and best practices <laughs> that we could collaborate on. I would now like to request Ms. Gao Le, Vice President, China Development Bank, to kindly address us. <laughs> Chinyan 世界经济复苏面临不少困难更加需要我们以开放包容的姿态加强合作为金砖国家经济增长开辟新空间我们的银行合作机制可以在促进经贸投资合作中发挥积极作用 金砖国家银行合作机制成立以来，国家开发银行在金砖国家累计投放贷款超过了一千亿美元，包括人民币贷款四百四十九亿元，项目涵盖了能源资源、基础设施、中小企业和金融合作。金砖国家均为发展中国家，面临着相似的发展问题，如妥善解决经济增长和发展失衡问题、环境治理问题，应对气候变化能力、扩大社会保障和基本公共服务、实现包容式增长等。为应对共同挑战，实现。发展目标金砖国家应在加强政策协调和战略对接最大限度寻求发展的利益切合点维护可持续发展我们积极倡导
在金砖国家合作机制下践行负责任融资理念，推动可持续发展。一是发展绿色经济，培育新的经济增长点。金砖国家经济正经历新旧动能转换，急需实施较深层次的结构性调整。从五国发展阶段看，基础设施建设仍将是推动金砖国家经济高速增长的重要动力之一。投资绿色基础设施，是延续金砖国家。经济长期可持续发展的重要因素，金砖国家可以通过把应对气候变化和环境治理的理念融入能源、科技、农业、数字基础设施建设等各领域，积极扩大绿色基建为核心的投资合作，培育新的经济增长点。提高劳动生产率和潜在的经济增长率，同时实现就业增长，减少碳排放和环境污染，提高能源资源利用效率。二是开展联合融资，支持金砖国家间绿色产业链合作。二零二零年，中国宣布在厦门。设立金砖国家新工业革命伙伴关系创新基地，着力加强金砖国家产业合作，向高附加值的知识型创造活动转移。金砖国家金金融机构可以共同探索新的双多边和双边投融资活动支持的具体领域，例如可以考虑。在绿色城市发展、智能电网、新型储能技术、新能源汽车、高效可再生能源技术、新能源基础设施等方面，为共同研究、联合制造等提供更多的融资，提升绿色产业价值链的合作水平。三是践行负责任融资，支持可持续发展。绿色金融正在迎来历史发展机遇，国际上许多银行已经将环境、社会和治理的风险与机遇纳入商业模式。这种做法的普及将有助于提升全球金融系统的稳健性，成为银行可持续发展战略的重要内容。二零二零年。中国国家主席习近平已经向世界承诺，二零三零年和二零六零年，中国将分别实现碳达峰和碳中和。金砖五国可以深入探讨支持绿色经济的金融措施和路径，在绿色产业、政策环境、金融风险等领域形成共识，创善。完善创新合作机制和对接战略规划，在具体的融资活动中，五家银行可以共同扩大绿色信贷能力，减少来自资源和污染密集行业的风险，从产品、流程、业务模式等方面开发用于绿色经济的金融产品和服务。推动培育和发展壮大一批绿色的市场化主体，同时积极探索基于生态补偿、碳排放权、碳交易等金融创新产品，支持长期绿色项目，并推动金砖国家债券市场绿色化。中国国家开发银行愿意与大家一起。参与绿色金融标准建设，完善绿色信贷管理制度和流程，系统推进绿色金融业务发展。我们也在助力中国打好污染防治攻坚战，促进绿色地碳发展。我们将深化与金砖国家银行合作机制的
各成员行的合作，推动。金砖国家绿色经济发展壮大，是用负责任融资行动支持金砖国家实现可持续发展。再次感谢印度进出口银行。Thank you very much, Madam, for your address and for highlighting the need for working towards sustainable development. Through responsible financing and innovation, uh, I would now call upon Professor Mark Swilling, Deputy Chairman, Development Bank of Southern Africa, to deliver an address. I would also like to share that the Honourable Minister has joined us. We extend a very warm welcome to him, and we would have the privilege of listening to him very shortly. I would uh, request Professor Mark Swilling to please address us now. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, and thank you to Indian Exim Bank for hosting and guiding uh, this uh, significant event. I think what I want to do is just build in the spirit of cooperation, build on uh, the references that have been made to um, the green economy and uh, the energy, the energy transition. Uh, I have in my previous input really provided an overview of the Development Bank of Southern Africa's strategic priorities. I won't do that again. At the center of the conversation in the South African context is this notion that is increasingly popular at a global level of the just transition. Uh, and this really is significant because it brings together uh, the, the, the challenge of inequality and poverty on the one hand, and on the other, the massive escalation in investments in renewables that are taking place now over 300 billion dollars double total investments in fossil fuels and nuclear combined uh, and so the question is how do these two come together south africa was the first country to refer to the just transition in its ndc uh, and so as a, as a bank we're really interested in in how we think about this and we adopted a policy framework recently and, and there's basically three ways of thinking about it. One way is to say it's just an energy transition. In other words, it's, it's about decarbonization and nothing else. So the inequality issue gets left out. The second is to say it's an energy transition where you mitigate the, the negative social consequences amongst workers who lose their jobs and communities impacted by coal closure. Uh, and then the third is to see the just transition as a, as a way of leveraging structural transformation or economic transformation, and in particular, the industrialization potential that uh, can be catalyzed if you get the prices right and the learning curves right uh, by the, uh, the, the increased investments in renewables, which we, are, which we are doing. So if one starts to think about it uh, that way, there may be a significant cooperation uh, between our countries and between our banking institutions, our DFI to investigate what kinds of rules and what kinds of learning and what kinds of institutional capacity makes it possible for these large investments in new uh, energy infrastructures that are going to take place, uh, to what extent those can actually drive um, an inequality reduction, uh, more socially inclusive agenda. And it's easier said than done uh, in, in our experience. I think nearly all of our countries, for example, have adopted the auction mechanism for procuring energy from independent power producers. And the question is, to what extent are those rules appropriate for a just transition agenda? We've been very inspired, for example, by the way in which the Brazilians do this, which is to have a team that monitors and adjusts the criteria, whereas we've had the same basic rules for a decade, um, and they're, they're, they're out of date. So, so the question would be, how, how do we, how do we, how would we co collaborate uh, to, 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 to learn from each other in these different country contexts, uh, what it really means to have an inclusive energy transition or a, or, or a just transition. And I've already referred to learning, but I think it also relates to, to funding. So there's a, there's a gradual buildup uh, of significant quantities of climate finance. Uh, which is important, but uh, you know, like the global financial facility is is not not that big. But 
the MD of the IMF and the UN Secretary General and others have been proud of to talk about debt for climate swaps. And that's also unsurprising because many of our countries are, are, are buckling under increased debt caused by COVID. And increased debt levels is not an appropriate place to be if you're looking for funding uh, for investing in the energy transition. So to what extent can increased debt levels be converted into mechanisms to leverage investment through a debt for climate stock type uh, mechanism. So, so I think those are some of the issues for collaboration. I think another area of collaboration that I think would be very significant for us is water. Um, we're a water scarce country. Climate change is having negative impacts on many African countries, um, negative impacts from a warmer water perspective. Um, and it is um, imperative that African countries start to develop national water strategies, which is what we've just done, and then figuring out what are the financial mechanisms to, to, to support it. Very different to energy. And again, that, that may be an area uh, of, of greater collaboration between, uh, between our institutions. So I think, I, I think just let me uh, leave it at that as, as a contribution to um, the, the debate and the discussion. Um, and, and these are many of, we wrestle with all of these issues within the African context on a, on a, on a continuous basis and try to develop appropriate financial mechanisms uh, to, 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 to back up those kinds of strategic concerns. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, keen insights and perspectives from an Africa's point of view, while highlighting the opportunities and challenges for the benefit of all of us. I now have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Marcos Troyo, President of the New Development Bank, to deliver his address and share his and perspectives, share perspectives of the NDB. Of the NDB please. Thank you very much. Hello to you all. Uh, my special acknowledgement and thanks to the Honorable Minister of State, uh, Dr. Bagwesh Karad. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for hosting this. I also want to say hello to the uh, leaders in development from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. You know, uh, the New Development Bank holds its partnership with the members of this BRICS interbank cooperation mechanism to the very highest uh, regard. As stated in our uh, mandate as an institution, the NDB seeks to complement the efforts of multilateral and regional financial institutions to support global growth and development. So promoting active collaboration with the partners around the table today the national development banks of our NDB member countries is an essential element for the bank to achieve its mandate. In the past year, as we all know and we've been discussing, it's been one of the most challenging uh, times uh, ever, brought about, of course, by the COVID pandemic. But even though the challenges were huge, the NDB has continued to grow and evolve, achieving some very important strides forward in its institutional development. In terms of the bank's operation, NDB's portfolio of projects has continued to grow and diversify. To date, the NDB has approved financing for around 80 infrastructure and sustainable development projects in all of our member countries, totaling a portfolio of about $30 billion. Over $9 billion of this financing is directly uh, uh, to fighting the uh, effects of COVID-19 across our member countries. Our lending activities have also increased, involving collaboration with national development banks and financial intermediaries. To date, we have approved more than $3.6 billion for seven operations that entail on, on lending through national financial intermediaries, including three operations with uh, BNDS and one with DBSA. And most recently, my friends, the NDB's Board of Governors approved the admission of the United Arab Emirates, Uruguay, and Bangladesh as the first new member countries to join the NDB. So our membership expansion is in line with our strategy to be positioned as a premier institution for emerging economies. The NDB and the members of the Interbank Cooperation Mechanism may seek to further replicate the models of collaboration that have been pursued between the NDB and its national development bank partners up to date. Many of our projects seek to leverage the expansive reach and capacity of national development banks to finance interventions in various sectors and regions, 
in the BRICS countries. Let me give you a few examples. NDB will provide a $500 million loan to BNDES for on landings to sub-projects that promote climate change, adaptation, and mitigation across a range of sectors. They include urban mobility, waste treatment, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. Altogether, the sub-projects will aim to help avoid around 4 million tons of CO2 emissions by the close of the decade. We may also seek to ramp up our joint support for projects that leverage technology and digital infrastructure to enhance delivery of public services and goods. A relevant project undertaken by NDB includes, for instance, a loan of $460 million provided by us to the government of Russia in order to improve efficiency, effectiveness, and transparency of the national judicial system. The project will be particularly technology intensive, implementing a set of innovative solutions to support the creation of a digital workplace in the justice system. The use of technology has been highlighted by so many of you can also be applied more actively to ensure that projects are planned and implemented effectively. A relevant project undertaken here at the NDB includes half a billion dollars provided by NDB to the government of India to support the construction of a rail corridor connecting the city of Delhi with the cities of Ghaziabad and Merarat. The project is making use of the latest technology to enhance planning, execution, and monitoring. The use of IT tools, such as intelligent 3D bottle-based uh, process for architectural planning, has been an essential element for the project's infrastructure design. Other IT applications are being used to facilitate communication and information management in the challenging COVID-19 work environment. It seems to us that in this with COVID world or post COVID world, more and more the traditional notions of physical infrastructure will be blended, embedded with technological tools. And finally, my friends, NDB and the members of the Interbank Cooperation Mechanism can also work closer together as a medium of knowledge exchange between the BRICS countries. In May of this year, the NDB and Ministry of Finance of India co-hosted a very important conference on social infrastructure financing. The conference explored ways of explaining financing for social infrastructure with a special focus on digital technologies to improve the delivery and quality of services. The seminar was organized in connection with the BRICS 2021 agenda under India's chairmanship of the BRICS, and we are open to engaging in similar uh, activities going forward. Well, the discussions today represent an important knowledge engagement held under India's chairmanship of the BRICS. Financial cooperation, as discussed today, is undoubtedly one of the main areas that has underpinned the success and relevance of BRICS cooperation up until this point. It is also an area in which we have a vast room for collaboration. We here at the New Development Bank uh, look forward to continue working with you all in the intercooperation mechanism to advance our common goals agenda. Thank you so very much. Thank you very, Thank much, you very sir. much, sir. Thoughts on the subject to bring about stronger cooperation among the development banks of BRICS and the NDB. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor and proud privilege to now invite our chief guest for today, Dr. Bhagwat Kishanrao Kararji, the Honorable Minister of State for Finance and Government of India, to deliver his much-awaited inaugural address and share his valuable insights, please. We once again thank you, sir, for very kindly consenting to our invitation to grace this occasion today. Thank you very much. President of NDB, Mr. Marcos Rajo, Chairman and President of Members Development Bank from BRICS, MD Harsha Banerjee, Bangari, sorry, representative of the financial sector community from the BRICS nations, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. At the outset, I commend the appropriate team for the BRICS summit 2021 under the India's chairmanship. BRICS at 15, intra-BRICS 
cooperation for co continuity consolidation and consensus as we may know all countries have their own aims and ideas of development yet there are similar challenges at the care of our policy making especially during the pandemic this theme makes the common solution to our common problems india believes that the empowering the solutions are created when partners engage at both a regional and global level we along with the other brics member are not bound by the traditional ideas of developmental cooperation since our inception we have successfully grown our terms of trade investment and human development however brics aims to become a more constructive and progressive group in the developing world brics countries are moving forward each new day with multi layer interactions this virtual meeting across time zones is a great testimony to this ladies and gentlemen india has been historically committed to developmental partnership we believe in vasudev kutumbakam the world is one family that is our motto and we participate this in our interactions with developing countries our enhanced cooperation is a proof of our commitment for developing nations however we must now collaborate even more to tackle these challenges at times the five brics economic economies offer a huge market for 43% of the world's population the global gdp grew at agr that is average annual growth rate of 3% between 2010 to 2019 at the same time the brics nations recorded a higher agr that is 4% the brics share in global exports has increased by approximately 3% during the same time most important is intra brics trade has increased at an agr of 7% between 2010 and 2019 and intra brics exports are now 10% of global exports the five institutions under the brics interbanks have cumulative experience of nearly 200 years this calls for their utilization in finding solutions towards the greater good of nations i appreciate the india's exim bank its thoughtful theme for the brics financial forum promoting economic growth and prosperity through brics financial cooperation the future of the brics inter brics cooperation mechanism depends on these five institutions and their cooperation for sustainable investments the partnership will spread across many areas like promoting new age products and new financial programs bank must ensure greater information sharing and discussion the common solutions the new development bank is another important step to strengthen the brics development banks the new development bank can mobilize resources and help grow our skill sharing practices i also commend the new development bank for its new members bangladesh uae and uruguay this takes brick cooperation to many more countries to conclude the next step for the brics is to lead the innovate thinking and practical response to the future challenges i believe in our pre proactive and inclusive cooperation to create an optimistic growth story 
BRICS must use this chance to take a roadmap leading to development centered globalization. This will allow more stable and inclusive socio-economic progress. Lastly, I am happy to Exim Bank has brought out this paper title, Enhancing BRICS Cooperation Way Forward. It has articles from some of the finest minds across the globe. Their contributions and ideas will surely provide fresh insights. I have also been told that the India Exim Banks has begun the BRICS Economic Research Awards in 2016. I congratulate the awards winners and the India Exim Banks in advance. I look forward to the brief presentation on the award winning thesis. Last but not the least, I want to compliment all BRIC members and financial institutions. These members have successfully carried forward the commitment made by BRICS nations through financial cooperation. Lastly, I congratulate all the members who have participated in this uh, uh, meeting and I extend my best wishes to all of you. Thank you very much. Respected sir, we are grateful to you for having graced this occasion with your presence and for delivering the inaugural address in this important event. We take note of your advice observations, guidance, and suggestion to strengthen this cooperation among the BRICS nations and especially among the members of the interbank cooperation mechanism. Your gracious presence, sir, has added much value to the financial forum, and we look forward to your continued guidance always. Ladies and gentlemen, as a tradition for the last five years, an important aspect of the BRICS financial forum is the announcement and presentation of the BRICS Economic Research Award that was instituted by India Exim Bank in 2016. I would now request my managing director, Madam Harsha Bangari, to please give the introductory remarks about the BRICS Economic Research Award and thereafter announce the winner of the BRICS Economic Research Award for 2021. Uh, in the context of India's chairmanship of the BRICS Forum in 2016 and under India Exim Bank's presidency of the BRICS ICM, India Exim Bank instituted the BRICS Economic Research Award in March 2016. As you would all agree, strong economic research has always been the basis for good, effective and efficient fol policy formulation. The objective of the BRICS Economic Research Award is to stimulate and encourage advanced doctoral research on economics related topics of contemporary relevance to the member nations of BRICS. The award comprises a citation, a medal and a prize money of Indian rupees 1.5 million, uh, approximately US dollars 21,000, sponsored by India Exim Bank. The award accepted as entries, a doctoral thesis written by nationals of any of the five member nations of BRICS who have been awarded a doctorate or accepted for award of a doctorate from any university or academic institution globally. The bank had disseminated the details of the award globally through advertisements in print and electronic media with assistance sought from overseas missions of the Government of India, missions of the BRICS nations in India and member development institutions. The details about the award were also widely publicized in universities and research institutions globally. We especially thank the member development banks for their kind support and assistance extended to us in disseminating the details of the award and encouraging scholars from their countries to apply for the award. I am especially happy to share that we had received an excellent response from scholars from all over the world for this award this year, representing nationalities of all the five member nations of BRICS. I also take this opportunity to thank all the member development banks for continuing the tradition started by India Exim Bank of facilitating the BRICS award winner during the annual BRICS financial forum ever since its inception in 2016. This, to select the award-winning thesis, Exim Bank had constituted an award jury comprising of eminent scholars of high repute, including Dr. Nagesh Kumar, 
director and CEO of the Institute for Studies in Industrial Development, New Delhi. Dr. Sebastian Morris, a senior professor at the Goa Institute of Management, Goa, and Dr. Ila Patnayak, Professor National Institution, Institute of Public Finance and Policy, New Delhi. After the conclusion of a rigorous evaluation process by the award jury, I am ha now happy to announce that the winner of India Exim Brick Bank's BRICS Economic Research Award for 2021 is Dr. Rahul Singh. Dr. Singh is connected with us today. Uh, we would all be able to see him on our screens very shortly. A warm welcome to Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh is currently Assistant Professor at the Amrut Modi School of Management, Ahmedabad University, Gujarat, India. My heartiest congratulations to Dr. Singh for having won the India Exim Bank BRICS Economic Research Award for 2021. Dr. Singh received his doctoral degree in 2020 from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, for his doctoral dissertation entitled Essays in International Trade in Post-Liberalization India. The thesis was written under the supervision of Professor Rupa Chanda, Professor Sovik Datta and Professor Vidya Saundararajan. I would now request my colleagues to display the certificate that we would be presenting to Dr. Rahul Singh and the cover page of the research study that India Exim Bank has published based on the award-winning thesis of Dr. Singh. Thereafter, I would request Dr. Singh to briefly deliver presentation on the key findings of his award-winning research work. The copy of the publication could also be downloaded from Exim's website. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. My heartiest congratulations to Dr. Rahul Singh. We are glad that you are able to be with us today to receive the award in person. I would request Madam Harsha Bangari, Managing Director, and Mr. N. Ramesh, Deputy Managing Director, India Exim Bank, to please felicitate and present the award to Dr. Rahul Singh. Thank you, thank you very much. For the benefit of all who are connected with us, I would request my colleagues to please display a copy of the citation that was presented to Dr. Singh just now. Thank you. Uh, I, will now uh, I will now also request my managing director and deputy managing director to please release India Exim Bank's occasional paper based on Dr. Singh's award-winning thesis. Thank you very much. The copies of these publica uh, this publication would also be made available on India Exim Bank's website under the research publication section. Those of you who would be interested are welcome to freely download this and read it in leisure. 
I would now like to invite Dr. Singh to give his brief presentation on the key findings of his award-winning thesis. While Dr. Singh delivers his presentation, those of you who have any questions may type them in the chat box and send them. I would request that the questions be very specific and brief and directed to Dr. Rahul Singh based on his award-winning thesis. Dr. Singh, welcome. I'm really honored to have received the BRICS Economics Research Award. Uh, my sincere thanks to India Exim Bank for considering my thesis for this award. Uh, I'm very grateful to my advisor, Professor Rupa Chanda, for her continued guidance and support through the years. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Chetan Subramanian, Professor Vidya Sandara Rajan, and Professor Sovik Datta for their uh, guidance and support through the years. Finally, I would also like to thank my family and friends who have supported me through my PhD journey. So my thesis focuses on the post-liberalization period, and uh, the focus is on two key changes that happened in the field of international trade. So the first salient trend that we observe in the late 90s and coming into the 2000s uh, is the increase in the incidence of regulatory measures. Developing countries increasingly started bringing in regulations that had the potential to affect international trade. So that's the first event I analyze. The second is one of the most salient events in the last three decades, which is the emergence of China as the largest manufacturing exporter. And so the research questions that this thesis addresses is how do these changes impact the Indian economy? And the focus is on analyzing their effect on firm performance and also on the employment consequences of these events. So the first question that my thesis addresses is we study the effect of restrictive technical regulations on the performance of firms in the maintaining country. So by technical regulations, what we refer to is the technical barriers to trade. There has been an increase in the incidence of TBTs over the years, particularly by India. And you know these refer to the standards, regulations, and procedures. And these leads to changes in the production process, and hence has the potential to affect international trade. And the novelty of this study is that we focus on the maintaining country. Typically, the literature focuses on studying the impact of regulations on exporters in source countries. Here, we look at the impact of restrictive technical regulations on the maintaining countries' firms. So in short, are there any costs associated with introducing regulations for the maintaining country firms? By restrictive, what we mean is that these regulations in some way negatively impact the imports into the country. And we measure performance by analyzing the effect of these regulations on physical efficiency and markups of firms. So as you can see, uh, over the years, there has been an increase in the number of products that have been covered under one regulation or the other, and which negatively impacts imports. So our main findings is that Restricti restrictive regulations have a potential to increase the cost of production. And this can lower import competition into the domestic market. And there is a concern that this would lead to an increase in market power and hence prices. On the other hand, this, these regulations can also lower access to intermediate inputs. And hence, domestic importers would be negatively impacted. And there might be an increase in marginal cost and reduced efficiency for these firms. So our main finding is that restrictive technical regulations in the industry actually has no significant effect on productivity and markups. However, the incidence of restrictive technical regulations on inputs to the industry has a significant negative impact on productivity and markups for importers. And we also observe an interesting phenomena for India, which is uh, you know, incomplete pass-through of cost to prices. So firms' changes in their marginal cost 
only partially feed through to prices and firms have to absorb either they have to increase or decrease their markups to absorb the remaining change. So what we observe is that consumers are not worse off. There is no differential effect on prices. However, firms experience an increase in their marginal cost and a reduction in their efficiency. That leads to a lowering of their markup or profit margins. So the policy implications is quite clear from this is that restrictive TBTs actually negatively impact the most productive firms. So if India is going to introduce a regulation that might have a negative consequence on imports, it has a negative impact on its own firms which are the most productive, that is the exporter-importers. Now, the, the key idea of this study is that legitimate public policy objectives can have unintended consequences for firm performance. And the policy implication is that measures should not be more trade restrictive than is necessary to achieve these objectives. And harmonization of standards and non-discriminatory provisions are some of the suggestions that uh, we provide. In the next part of the thesis, what we analyze is the impact of increased Chinese imports on the performance of manufacturing firms in India. As is clear from this graph, there has been a substantial increase in Chinese import share for practically any set of countries. However, one important thing to note is that India in particular has experienced a substantial increase in Chinese import share in, compared to the late 90s when it was close to 3%. By the end of 2007, a remarkable 18% of all imports were coming from China. So the, the, the idea of the study is to analyze the effect of this significant event on the manufacturing firm performance in India. Another reason that Chinese imports is interesting to a researcher is that they provides plausibly exogenous variation. And Chinese increase in Chinese imports is likely to be uncorrelated with domestic demand and technology shocks because it was driven by China's internal reform and the ensuing productivity gains in manufacturing that China experienced, and finally with its accession to the WTO in 2001. So one benefit of studying uh, Chinese imports is we can be fairly confident that we are capturing the effect of import competition on firm performance and not necessarily any unobserved factors like uh, demand shocks and technology shocks. So it enables clean identification, and that is another uh, important point. So there are two mechanisms by which, uh, two uh, areas that we study. One is how does Chinese imports affects the manufacturing firm performance, which is we capture it through efficiency, profits, and prices. And we also look at the effect of Chinese imports on the employment of the formal sector. So our main finding is that Chinese imports actually lead to a large reduction in marginal cost for Indian manufacturing firms. So it is actually good for Indian manufacturing firms, especially for the formal sector. We find that there is an increase in Chinese import competition and that forces manufacturing firms to adjust, become more efficient by reducing their marginal cost. And also, uh, you know, Indian manufacturing firms experience an increased access to imported inputs from China. That really leads to a reduction in marginal cost for these firms. However, what we find is that these savings are only partially passed through to prices. Only about 30% of the cost savings are passed on to prices, and there is an increase in firm markup. So all, overall, the primary beneficiaries of trade with China seem to be the manufacturing firms, while consumers also experience some reduction in prices. On the employment side, what we find is that higher Chinese import competition in an industry, it actually increases the employment share in formal enterprises, which is often uh, a policy objective. There is an absolute increase in total formal enterprise employment. Employment in the formal sector actually increases in absolute numbers. This is dominated by the most productive firms. Firms which were most productive, they actually expand at the expense of less productive firms. And a, an important point here to note is that this expansion is driven by increase in contract employment, which do not carry any firing cost. We also observe a decrease in informal enterprise employment. In, informal enterprises typically are less productive, and what this suggests is that China, they are not able to compete with Chinese imports, and 
Some of them shrink and others exit the market and those resources get reallocated to the more productive formal sector. So this is suggestive of the reallocation of employment from the less productive informal enterprises towards the more productive formal enterprises. So to the key takeaway from uh, the findings of this study is that Chinese imports actually have had a positive impact on the Indian manufacturing sector. And as I discussed earlier, this was due to the reallocation of resources due to import competition from China. And also, very importantly, Indian firms get access to Chinese intermediate inputs, which are uh, price to price, they are higher quality, and they enable a reduction in marginal cost for these firms. So one thing to note is that the informal sector, it's very clear that it was negatively impacted due to increased Chinese import competition. And you know, policies enabling reallocation of these workers to other sectors which can absorb them uh, would be useful. So something like a social safety nets for affected workers uh, is the, could be the way to go. Uh, but the evidence is very clear that Chinese imports tend to be beneficial for the formal sector manufacturing firms in India. Thank you, and uh, I can take questions if any. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for that very interesting and articulate presentation. I'm sure many of us would be uh, very keen to read through this work in detail and deliberate upon the findings of this uh, work offline with you directly. With the permission of the chair, uh, we could perhaps have a few minutes of question and answer session. And those of you who have any questions may type them in the chat box. We have already received a few questions and I would uh, hand them over to uh, Dr. Rahul Singh and I would request him to choose a few questions and answer them, please. So uh, one question is that you mentioned about China's accession to the WTO in 2001, having further accelerated the increase in Chinese export. Uh, do you mean to say China would not have grown and dominated the world as it does today had it not been a part of WTO? Uh, that uh, I think would be very difficult to conjecture, but the evidence is quite clear that there is a break in trend. So we do observe a substantial increase post uh, the accession to WTO in 2001. And uh, there are some reasons why one may conjecture that that is the case. It led to decrease in tariffs that were being in place uh, in the destination market, as well as a reduction in tariffs for imports coming into China. Uh, how has TBT been impacting India's export capabilities? So uh, I, I did test some of these hypotheses. So uh, the TBT regulations I studied, they tend to have no effect on exports. So neither negative nor positive. So statistically insignificant effect on exports. But that is one point of evidence. We need much more work. And that's an excellent question, I think, worth exploring. The article speaks about the growth of contract labor due to increase in China imports. In a developing country context, and India specifically, is it fine to have more people on contracts when more than 90% of people are working in an organized sector? Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, I mean, we need a lot of work uh, on that front. But one thing is very clear that if we, if we assume that workers get paid based on the, how efficient they are and what's their marginal product, uh, it is very clear from the data that unorganized workers earn the least followed by contract workers, followed by permanent regular workers. So in that sense, a transition from uh, being an, uh, in the unorganized sector to being a formal uh, contract worker is a step up, if we obviously under the assumptions that they are being paid based on how good they are. So and uh, in India, there is also some legal protection afforded to contract workers, which are often not uh, available uh, to the unorganized sector. So uh, while the exact question is very difficult to answer and one, one needs to really go into the details, uh, but uh, from the wages, one, one could infer that you know, it's a step up. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, the essay mentions that the analysis uses detailed data on sales and physical quantities at the firm product level for Indian manufacturing from prowess to study the effect of import, Chinese import competition on prices and its underlying components. Uh, is your analysis sector agonistic? If not, was there any differences in terms of impact of Chinese imports across sectors? Also, have you considered the impact on Indian SMEs considering you have used sales data from Provis? So that's a good question. So uh, yes, so the results I'm uh, reporting are the average effects. Uh, and we did not really see too much heterogeneity, uh, 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 consistent heterogeneity across sector based on certain uh, industry characteristics that we tested. Uh, in fact, in, 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 the, in another paper, we do look at using the entire Indian manufacturing sector using annual survey of industries, and the same results hold up. We do see a reallocation from less productive manufacturing firms to the high productive manufacturing firms. So what we do see from prowess data, where always there is this concern that we are missing out on the small firms, uh, the results are corroborated when we look at it uh, using the annual survey of industries. So my sense is that these results are robust and it holds for the entire distribution of the, at least the formal manufacturing sector. Yeah, I think. I think that's it. Any other questions? Well, th thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Uh, well, I'm sure there would thank be many more questions. And uh, once people download your publication, they will get an opportunity uh, to uh, interact with you and to share their with you. Uh, and, uh, 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 due to the paucity of time and uh, uh, being able to this is, uh, spanning from Brazil to China, and it's already quite late in China, we will come to a close of this session now. Well, thank you very much to all the participants and for, for asking their questions. And thank you very much, of course, to Dr. Singh for very patiently answering them. I also take this opportunity to uh, announce that India Exam Bank's research publication titled A Compendium on Enhancing BRICS Cooperation, The Way Forward, uh, has been uploaded on the India Exam Bank's website. For those of you who uh, are interested uh, to download the publication, are uh, encouraged to visit Exam Bank's website and please download exam. it and read it. This is a compendium of articles by leading global thinkers, economists, practitioners on the topics on various topics of contemporary relevance to BRICS. So I'm sure uh, most of you would find it very interesting. Well, as we come to the close of this uh, session, I would request Mr. N. Ramesh, our Deputy Managing Director, to kindly propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of India Exim Bank. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Bhagwat Kishan Rao Karaji, Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India. Mr. Gustavo Montezano, President, Brazilian Development Bank, BNDES, Ms. Natalia Timakova, Deputy Chairperson and Member of Board, VEB.RF, Madam uh, Gaule, Vice President, China Development Bank, Professor Mark Swilling, Deputy Chairman, Development Bank of Southern Africa, Ms. Sarsha Bangari, Managing Director, India Exim Bank, uh, Mr. Marcos uh, Troyo, President, New Development Bank, delegates from the BRICS develop member development banks, ladies and gentlemen. As we come to the conclusion of today's program, on behalf of India Exim Bank, it's my privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks to all dignitaries and guests who have joined us for the BRICS annual financial forum organized by India Exim Bank. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. Bhagavat Krishna Rao Karaji, Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India for his gracious presence and for delivering his inaugural address. Sir, your encouraging presence and insightful remarks have indeed added value to the important financial forum. A special thanks to the heads of the members of development banks, Mr. Gustavo Montazono, Ms. Natalia Timakova, Ms. Gaule, Mr. Mark, Professor Mark Swilling, and Mr. Marcos Troyo, 
President New Development Bank for your very active participation in the deliberations and for your incisive perspectives on the subject. All of you have very specifically mentioned on the three eyes of the development, financial, uh, development finance, infrastructure, investment, and innovation. You have also extensively spoken on how to promote green development, green economy by appropriate financing measures and the uh, finan financing of the uh, various measures taken to COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, has been uh, very much appreciated. We value our strong association as members of the interbank cooperation mechanism and look forward to our continued engagement in future. I also take this opportunity to convey my heartiest congratulations to Dr. Rahul Singh for having won the Exim Bank BRICS Economic Research Award for 2021. Dr. Singh, thank you for coming over to Mumbai on our invitation to receive the award in person and for sharing the key findings of your award-winning doctoral research work. I'm sure our audience would also find the research work very thoughtful. The BRICS nation have been engines of economic growth and have displays, displayed immense potential by accomplishing remarkable milestones. In recent times, due to COVID-19 pandemic, the member countries have witnessed several monetary and fiscal revisions and extended certain relaxation to address some of the challenges brought by this pandemic. The member economies have started recovering and show tremendous potential to be global leaders. Financial cooperation is a prerequisite for improving the economic and social situation on a global scale. Today's global challenges require transnational resolutions based on multilateral cooperation. I am confident that deliberations during such financial fora would play an important role in this direction. I'm, I thank you once again to all of you for participating in this uh, deliberations. Thank you very much.